Okay, uh, now, we, now we have sound. I'm uh, typically a loud enough person uh, without a microphone, so um, <laughs> I'm sure we'll manage. Um, so thank you very much again for the introduction. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here, my first time in Moscow. Um, as he said, I'm a researcher at uh, Fraunhofer Institute. Um, some of my research topics are trust infrastructures, blockchain, and of course AI, why we are all here today. And I'm fortunate enough to be alongside some of the other leading and uh, uh, outstanding researchers in both Russia and in Germany, which we are all fortunate to hear some insights um, about AI today. Um, I would like them all to introduce themselves in hopefully two or three minutes to keep on time. Um, just uh, a little bit about your background, some of your research, and uh, maybe a fun fact about AI if you want to. Um, I would like to start off with my colleague um, on the far end, Dr. Kubak, Mikhail Kubak. Um, would you please give an introduction? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Rachel. Thanks as well for the invitation here. It's a great honor. So my name is Michael Kubach. I'm from the Fraunhofer Institute of Industrial Engineering. As you've already heard, we are based in Stuttgart in southern Germany, and I myself, I'm uh, based in, in Berlin. So we are doing research on different topics of identity management, IT security, privacy. So this is our main, the main topic of our team in the institute. Fraunhofer is a uh, Institute of Applied Science, so we are not doing any teaching, we're not doing any basic research, but we're working together with uh, mainly uh, industry partners, and uh, if it is necessary, we team up with other universities to, do, to bring research into practice, so this is what we are mainly doing. My um, research interests are the interests of our team, um, yeah, uh, that is related to AI, goes into the direction of like the huge amounts of data that we have, there's also, so that we need to protect, but there's also relationships to privacy of this data, uh, how can we preserve privacy here, and then we have connections to blockchain and uh, other distributed ledger technologies, I guess we'll have the time here in the discussion to go a bit more into detail. Is this working? Okay. Next up, we have Dr. Konstantin Yakovlev. Would you please give a short introduction for us? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my name is Konstantin, which is Greek name, right? Uh, so as uh, you can read, uh, I have affiliation with Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, which is uh, one of the top universities in, in Russia. And two, I believe, yeah, two Nobel winners are the alumni of this university. Actually, my primary affiliation is like Russian Academy of Sciences, one of the Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences, where we do mainly like basic research. And uh, MIPT, we work with students. Uh, I also uh, have affiliation with Higher School of Economics. So Andrei Ustizhanin is my peer from Computer Science Faculty. And my research uh, interests are uh, you know, like uh, in you know, like uh, if I put it, put them narrow, uh, it will be you know like some sort of navigation for intelligent agents like robots, for example. So we do a lot of research in path planning, in computer vision for robotic systems, in mapping, in you know localization algorithms, in multi-robot systems, in multi-agent systems, in cognitive agents, and stuff like this. So yeah, that's. Basically, thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, Professor Dr. Ali Sunaif from the KIT Institute. Yes, hello, my name is Ali Sunaif. I was born uh, and grew up in Moscow. And it so happened that I went to Germany, got my education there at the Munich Technical uh, Institute of Technology. I got my PhD there and worked in different countries. In Howard, uh, Cologne, uh, and other countries and cities. And now I'm professor of computer science at Karlsruhe. 
and head of Applied Informatics Institute. Now I'll switch to English, it's much easier for me. So we are mainly focusing uh, distributed systems and all emerging internet-based technologies. And currently we are looking at the integration of AI and DLT. So how can we uh, use artificial intelligence for distributed ledger technology applications and uh, vice versa? I hope I will get a chance to tell more about it in the next minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so our um, last panelist, but definitely not least, is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Maxime Fedor. I'm trying. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is uh, Maxim Fedorov. I uh, had a PhD at uh, Pushina University in, outside of Moscow. And actually, we focused on big data. We never used that term back then, but we had so much data, biomedicine, physics. Well, this, is where it all, this is where it all started. And 20 years later, I realized that I actually was dealing with uh, big data and computer science. We worked with uh, hundreds of terabytes of data and so many years ago we used parallel algorithms, machine learning. I often show the bulletins from conferences uh, I like the 1998 conference uh, report. Uh, now, can you find any of the words uh, today that were not used in those years, like 20 years ago? The industry was not much interested, was mainly used in academic science, but right now AI, big data, and are widely used everywhere. That's the, uh, the buzzwords. AI is very popular, it's, and uh, many heads of state uh, use that word uh, in their statements. In 2016, after a long career spanning many countries, Ireland, uh, Germany, the UK, previously I was the head of a supercomputer center in Glasgow, and now I went to Skoltech. And I'm head of the Big Data Chair. We have two English language courses, two English language degrees. There's a master's degree and also a postgraduate degree. It's a young center, but we do publish a lot of research papers, prestigious magazines, and prestigious journals. We are. Uh, we have teamed up with Philips, Huawei, a lot of uh, cooperation is with Gazprom Neft, uh, Sberbank. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I was waiting for the translation to be done. But um, so as we've uh, just witnessed, uh, we have a lot of pre prestigious uh, speakers up here today. and. My goal today with the panel was that I wanted to take this knowledge that we have and to uh, relate it to the audience. So I have four main questions that I want to ask these panelists that are related to how AI will affect society, our everyday lives as uh, individuals, um, challenges, or maybe what it is for the industries or other aspects of our lives. So the first question that I have is, how will AI affect society in general? And for this one, I would like to first point out um, Mr. Konstantin uh, Yakovlev. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I've uh, read some of your blog articles about that you're often asked um, how will, if, if robots will take over humanity. So can you give us uh, some feedback? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for, for the question. Yeah, that's kind of like really question which I hear a lot, so everybody's interested like in, in any audience when we're talking about uh, you know like intersection of AI and robotics, when will this Terminator came and you know like invade the 
the humanity. So uh, the short answer is yeah, not soon probably. <laughs> so I, to, to calm you down all, right? And the um, uh, longer version of, of uh, the answer is, yeah, of course, uh, kind of we obviously witnessing that AI uh, as a scientific discipline, which actually like emerged quite a long ago, right? And witnessed a few, you know, like uh, uh, drops and raises. Uh, it's it's again on the raise now, and uh, by now we have uh, this. Uh, by by now we're at the point where we're able to uh, move from you know like from the lab environment to you know like to our everyday life, at least for some you know like narrow problems. Maybe we're not able still to create you know like a universal you know like robot which will take care of everything, but maybe we can create some uh, you know like uh, specifically tailored to some specific task robot and it actually like helps helps us a lot for example uh, you've probably heard that this one of the biggest uh, retailer nowadays which is Amazon uh, they really are reducing costs by uh, automating their warehouses it's like a really a, a big thing in, in industry nowadays in this you know like logistics delivery and stuff like this uh, so they have these like robots in their warehouses, which actually, you know, like help people sorting, you know, like piles of goods and stuff like this. And it's uh, and they basically work, you know, like 24/7 and stuff like this. So we cannot, you know, like neglect that uh, we're at this point of, uh, you know, like uh, of, uh, so the, the technology is mature enough uh, that we're able to actually create some. You know, like relevant products uh, out of these methods and algorithms. So, like maybe like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, AI. I mean, like it was existent, obviously, but it was more like a bunch of you know, like smart guys, like researchers, like me in the labs. They were you know, like writing, like solving some tricky problems and writing papers and stuff like this. And nowadays, we are witnessing that uh, these there is a like. Uh, it takes really you know, like short period of time from these papers to actually like uh, implementations in some you know like technologies or like software which is not kind of research based software but kind of industry based software and so definitely uh, the answer is uh, yes uh, uh, AI is obviously you know like influence our like everyday life but in my opinion we we are not like I mean, like it's overhyped in the media that we're having you know, like some revolution or stuff like this. Uh, uh, the thing is that, in my opinion, it's more like evol uh, In my opinion, it's still more like evolutionary, you know, like steps. So, uh, yeah, maybe we're now having you know like much more like powerful computers. We have these GPUs, and we have this. Uh, for example, in my area in, in robotics, we have this very, you know, like cheap sensors which we can dream of, you know, like 10 years ago. It was like not possible. Now it is possible, uh, but still, it's it's not like it, you know, like it, it comes like in like in short period of time. So it's more like uh, evolution. So I think that we will witness the evolutionary, uh, you know, like step by step uh, development. Uh, and gradual, you know, like penetrating of, you know, like uh, AI in the form of, you know, like technologies in our everyday lives. And it's up to us, uh, I mean, like up to humans, how we actually, what sort of, you know, like non-technical mechanisms uh, uh, we, we will create to actually incorporate these things in our lives. Thank you. So... Not yet is uh, the short answer, but uh, we've already made it quite far in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, so I would like to now direct uh, the attention to um, Ali. Uh, what is your take on this and the societal impact or maybe what kind of applications or AI applications do you see that will impact society? Um, okay, so Rachel, let me sort this. So if we uh, speak about applications that are nowadays available, we speak about light AI. So um, this makes sense where if it's done properly, we have a lower error rate if it comes to precision, accuracy, speed, then these applications are probably better than human beings. And uh, we s well, really observe them right now. So. There are applications in finance, think of um, algorithmic trading, high-frequency trading, uh, think of, uh, we 
spoke about it yesterday, this robot, Vera, in human resources and recruiting, where the AI agent can screen the resume, resumes, the applications, and uh, sort them, rank them, and even predict how the job performance will be in the future. Um, think of chatbots. Um, your question is rather big because you know it will affect us not only on the personal level, of course it will affect the organizations and enterprises, it will affect a bunch of industries, and of course it will affect us uh, as a society. And there are a um, bunch of grand challenges, uh, let me be more specific maybe with three of them. So for society, what is uh, of importance to us? It's about energy, it's about mobility, it's about medicine. So with energy, think of uh, energy forecasting, where uh, AI agents inform about um, supply and demand of energy, energy efficiency, energy uh, accessibility. If it comes to medicine, of course, it can be used as decision support systems what kind of therapy is right to the particular case. And uh, we are actually involved in one of the research projects. I maybe tell, it about, uh, tell more about it later. And think of mobility. So uh, like key word, self-driving cars, uh, it will completely change the traffic in Moscow. <laughs> and of course, it will affect us as a society. And uh, you know what? Uh, uh, of course, it's only light AI, but uh, I guess uh, Almost all of us in this room are young enough that we will see the advantages of such uh, uh, AI application uh, used in self-driving cars. It will make our mobility life much uh, easier in some way. Um, I, I have a funny, you know, like a funny <laughs> comment on the self-driving cars. Can I, you know, expand like maybe yeah, like please. one minute? Yeah. So I was in uh, at this conference uh, on. Now planning, which is you know like my primarily areas of interest in, in Pittsburgh, uh, where we have this Carnegie Mellon University, in 2017, and at this point of time, Uber uh, chose uh, Pittsburgh to be one of the testing ground when they were testing you know like uh, driverless cars. They were like Volvo cars. Uh, so and there was actually so they were actually like driving by themselves I've seen them with my own eyes, but there was a guy sitting at the driver's seat So in case something goes wrong it intercepts the control But the thing is that on the passenger seat there was another guy sitting who was the software engineering with a laptop who you know like who was controlling the how how the control system actually works so just think about it we were amazed at the conference that actually like self-driving car state-of-the-art in 2013 uh, 17 required two people to actually, you know, like carry me as a passenger from like one point to another. So it's a kind of like, funny command. I'm sorry for <laughs> interrupting. No, thank you. And, and please, um, if any of you um, also have another comment. Um, another thing, uh, would you say that the impact on society is always positive or generally more positive than negative of AI? I mean, I know we're all probably more enthusiasts, so. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a security researcher, and so and a German, so I'm like skeptical, of course, and <laughs> maybe with a bad mood. So, uh, of course, this opens also a lot of new attack vectors, that is AI applications. So, um, at first, of course, uh, it looks similar. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so, it, it was a bit hard, yes. Uh, it was uh, two years ago. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so we have different new attack vectors here. So at first you can, of course, try to, to, to trick the AI by different, like, inputs, by using, like, adversarial inputs. So there has been this ex example demonstration for when we stay at self-driving cars, you put stickers on a stop sign, and then uh, for a human, it's still a stop sign, it's no problem, you would stop, but uh, the self-driving car, the AI vision, uh, gets so disturbed that it thinks it, uh, the sign just says, you can go 50 here, so, and uh, the self-driving car doesn't stop, or you can uh, put some noise over images, and the image for the human just looks exactly the same, but the uh, AI classification algorithm classifies it as completely something different, so. This is a uh, this is a problem here. Yeah, valid um, point. 
Okay, yeah. thank you. Or of course, I can uh, go on. So there are a lot of different uh, other uh, other aspects, but yeah, just as an as one example here. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll move on to our, our next big question. Um, so, which influence will AI have on a person or an individual or our everyday life? So, this one I would like to direct to Maxime. Um, what do you believe the impact of AI will be in our lives in 2030, so about 10 years from now? How will this affect our everyday life? A lot will change, but the most drastic change will take place in education. Right now we are in an era when we have to pursue continuous learning. The high tech industry says that you have there are about a 500 day distance between one training and another training and that period is getting shorter in 10 years time we'll have more gadgets there'll be more uh, driverless vehicles i don't think that all of the in personal private cars will be uh, driverless. But in many countries we have a subway which is driven without uh, pilots. Take passenger jets. Manual, it's only manually driven within two minutes of the flight and the rest is autopilot. But I believe the biggest impact would be smart assistance. It would be education. It's kind of a co-evolution. -ev it's happening right now, and the person, uh, me, we, humankind, ev evolve with the means of production. Fire has changed us as a biological species. Right now, we're seeing this co-evolution together with these uh, smart gadgets, and indeed, indeed, that will change our lives and management tools, management methods, the way we manage our staff, the way we manage our production facilities. Urbanization might peak out in the next 10 years, and then the technology would be so advanced that people would start to uh, sprawl around the planet uh, by small groups like small high-tech villages everywhere. That's what we see in the UK. These high-tech villages are, are very popular. People put up a wind a turbine and you just need to, the internet and that's it. You have a different, they have a different lifestyle in their homes, uh, in the countryside, compared with uh, the big city. These trends uh, will gain traction, and a lot will change in terms of lifestyle, in terms of education, in terms of understanding what work is, what a relationship is between the employer and the employee. Thank you. Talking of the education going forward. Well, that's actually very relevant issues for students and universities. So will, my, will the dream of my students come true? They think that they will be able to upload knowledge to their brain. I will just get all the information via a cable, then I'll get a, an upgrade and that's it. I don't need any, I won't need any teachers going forward. We just need moderators maybe. Well that's science fiction. Uploading knowledge directly to your brain. There have been some experiments saying that the throughput of our visual channel and audio, visual, audio channel is really powerful. But it may be just one book, sci-fi book or sci-fi film. It doesn't really make sense to get the knowledge straight to your brain. But there are newer gadgets, there are newer technologies that enable you to, you know, 
assess the person's type. There are visuals, kinesthetics. There are many types of people, and you can develop that. You are kinesthetic to die, but with additional exercises, with additional training, you may become a visual slash kinesthetic. So you can gauge the response of an individual to the information that is delivered to him. You can customize the way information is delivered to you, the way training is delivered to you. Online will, education will be important for retraining, but universities will still be important face-to-face. -face. Training will be important for basic education because there are so many non-verbal channels during education. We're just getting the first grasp of that. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, okay, for uh, yeah, I, I would like maybe to add very brief, briefly. Well, even if it might be possible to upload all this information, there might be other competences that might be relevant there. I mean, we have seen in the past now more or less every information is available mm -hmm. at your hand. Like you can go just online, you can go to a search engine, and you have everything. Like. 20, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, you had to go to a library. It was very hard to find out uh, the birth date of someone or whatever. So, and now you just have to be able to sort all this information and to, to bring this um, into a relationship. So even if such AI um, or such brain interfaces will be there, then I don't know which, which competence it will be, but it will be another competence that will be relevant. So I guess this is something that still stays here. Thank you. Um, actually, my next question, or unless, would you like to, okay, um, is uh, also to you as well, um, Mikhail, about um, the different privacy or security challenges that people will face maybe in 2030 for AI. Um, well, I guess some, uh, one was already mentioned a little bit, like tricking the AI with adversarial inputs. Um, there could also be like challenges when it comes to personal data or other sensitive data that is in the training sets. And it has been uh, demonstrated that they, you can create inputs um, that let you create, again, outputs where you can read what has been in the training data but it, 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 that wasn't supposed to get out of the training data, but you can create inputs. And so you have to be careful about that when it comes to protecting sensitive information that you have maybe in your company or, or that is uh, sensitive information uh, about the people uh, that, uh, like, for example, medical dat data that has been used. And you, don't, uh, you want to be careful about this. So these are uh, questions uh, that, uh, that are still uh, super relevant here, I would say. But I'm not all, like, all skeptic, of course. Um, like, like what we heard before, one pot potential application of AI is also these smart assistants. And I think that smart assistants can also be used to support people um, when managing their data. So, because of course, today now we have um, um, the situation already that we use so many different interfaces, so many different platforms. We don't know where all our data is going and maybe we have a smart assistant that's, that's also a security or a privacy assistant that is supporting us when managing all our data, when protecting our data. So this would be something that um, um, yeah, could help us here and I think this is an, an important aspect as well. So I'm not just uh, critical of everything here. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so the next topic uh, we want to conquer here is um, what areas of life uh, will AI affect the most? Or maybe which industries, to make it a little bit easier. So healthcare, logistics, productions, communications, and et cetera, and, and why? So for this one, I would like to put the spotlight on uh, Ali. Could you maybe uh, share some of your research initiatives from Germany or maybe some projects that you've worked on in the industry? related to AI? Um, yes, I may. But first, let me tell you that I'm a fellow, I'm a scientist, that's why. I'm uh, quite uh, indifferent to the analogies. Uh, you have to know what the systems can do and what they cannot do. So, the, um, 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 so you know, uh, AI, uh, Current AI agents uh, rely heavily on a huge amount of high-quality data. Uh, 
So to you know to train it um, effectively and to get uh, AI models of high quality, uh, they just need it. And what we are looking at is um, an integration of um, AI and um, blockchain technology because um, a blockchain can be used for uh, um, the enablement of such data markets that are needed for AI. I actually really enjoyed the talk of um, uh, Andre um, from the Yandex Lab at the Ohio School of Economics uh, because he showed a slide on um, explainable AI. And um, I think that the transparency of AI, the explainability of AI is a very important issue because um, uh, if um, e an AI agent uh, provides uh, um, a treatment for a specific uh, disease and neither the physician nor the patient can uh, understand uh, and can trace and can comprehend uh, why uh, the IJ agent came with this suggestion. It will probably will not be adopted. Uh, and um, this Im you know, immutable ledger can provide a possibility to uh, make it not only traceable, but also comprehensible and uh, trustable uh, for uh, using such applications. And uh, to be more specific, we are working, um, we have several projects. One of them is in the area of uh, medicine or healthcare, together with the German uh, Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg. With two research groups, we are establishing a blockchain-based platform for genomics so that, you know, we can donate our blood and there is discussion about donating our organs. Why not donate our DNA or our genomes? Um, because with other AI methods and tools, people can uh, find uh, new treatments for um, um, even very rare um, cancer situations. And um, um, I'm very proud of this project because it involves um, rather uh, big and famous institutions in Germany, not only um, the German Research Council Center, but also the Helmholtz Center in Munich and uh, some center of Charité in Berlin, which is the biggest uh, university hospital in Germany. Um, and um, uh, the idea is to uh, lose the data silos that are available right now. I talked about my research area, distributed systems, to really kind of, you know, combine them. And um, uh, I think that it may be of interest to some of you guys here. So if you have some, of course, you want to use this data to get a Nobel Prize and to research on it, but maybe after some period of time to share it with other research groups, um, we are working on providing an infrastructure for it. And my research interests are about the design of such a system. The operative stuff is not, I'm not interested in that. But the questions on how to do so, uh, what data is stored, where the data is stored, who has access to this data, for what purposes does one have access to the data. We don't plan to store the data on the blockchain. It's not designed for the large data sets but it seems to be a reasonable solution to um, enable the uh, control of the access to this data. And that's what we are going to use it for. Thank you. Um, now that we have some insight to some of the German research, um, Maxime, could you give us some of the um, research that's been done at the Skoltech and uh, in, in Russia in general with AI and um, maybe in the healthcare center, uh, healthcare sector? Yes, we do a lot. Uh, investigating machine learning tools obviously doesn't work. We study how machine learning can be used for biology and healthcare purposes. There is a number of projects which may be quite beneficial in terms of the results they bring about the first project I am involved. 
is uh, the study of the chemical environment in order to find some new biological components or the compounds. We're speaking about global problems. One of the global problems in the area of biology and to healthcare, this is lack of new promising compounds for medications, for drugs. Well, there are lots of uh, libraries and databases of uh, the active, bioactive compounds, but uh, there are lots of uh, traps on that way. Pitfalls. If you want to sell your medications uh, uh, in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, big numbers, it should be a drug, a pill, and pill should be sellable. It cannot be an injection, and many compounds, they are just like a brick, they cannot be solved, especially in saliva. Why this is so, and actually, this is what we do not know, maybe it just happens so. Just like you mine gold, you found uh, a gold deposit and you mine it until it ends. Probably some known biologically active compounds or the known drugs, they belong to some area of a chemical environment just a combination of the molecules and uh, this is 10 times 60 this is more than we have atoms in our galaxy and we try to use machine learning tools in order to find your islands uh, new promising biologically active compounds our project is called the navigation in the chemical and biological galaxy or universe Another project I may highlight, we are working on the new methods of uh, biomedical diagnostics along with Philips and a number of leading labs. Skoltech is also pursuing a joint project uh, with the National Technological In Initiative and many advanced um, labs of Moscow, a lot of academia from Moscow. And we do that from not from the molecular standpoint, but from other standpoints, a comprehensive picture. This is what we focus on. So we consider man to be a complex, uh, complex entity. So we study the biological data, the genetics data, and the current healthcare records. The results are very interesting, and the fact that more and more companies from healthcare industry want to cooperate with us uh, is another proof of what we're doing. Um, do any of our other panelists maybe have something to add on uh, what industries of, are most important for AI? Maybe? So, uh, first, uh, you know, you observe something very rare. A scientist agrees with other scientists. Uh, <laughs> I, I must support Maxime uh, on, on this take. Uh, so, I think computer science is quite important for AI. Uh, of course, also math and ethics and philosophical questions and sociology. But I think that computer science um, is evolving and changing, and that's how uh, research goes. So let us uh, also think of basic research, because we uh, really actually need basic research and investments in basic research to apply it in maybe five, 10, 20 years, I don't know, hopefully in only one year, but without basic research, we will not be able to uh, compete. And if we speak of AI, I guess also Maxime mentioned it yesterday at um, Skoltech that China is uh, uh, doing a lot of effort um, and that way and to all the examples we observe or we discuss especially on the ethical side, they are actually coming from China and why? Because they're just executing it. You ask, you know, I, uh, um, uh, I'm working in Europe, so currently I'm working in Europe, so of course I have a European point of view, it's a very, you know, uh, privacy-related, uh, um, very, very um, controversial point of view with um, a lot of discussions and very democratic uh, way to do so, and um, I believe that right now it's the human people who provide the AI agents with data. So we decide what do we train them. And then nobody has, so if somebody then kind of sees the examples that uh, uh, there's a gender topic or other people are discriminated or whatever, it's because it was trained on the data that somebody made a decision to give it. Mm -hmm. um, so there is um, plenty of questions uh, we 
could talk about. Thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to yes, add something? Yes, I just want to stress what, what Ali has already like mentioned when it comes to his project in, in the genome, genome medicine uh, area. I think this is important for every area. Like, yeah, we have heard China, the big uh, companies there, Alibaba, Baidu, and so on, they have a lot of data. Like, and if we say data is the new oil, or earlier uh, we have seen in the, in the talk by Andre that uh, we, we trained it with more data and it, was, it became better. So this is the major thing. We need to find a way how we, we get over this and how we can compete with uh, um, uh, countries that are with players that have all this, uh, this much data, or in the US, the big platform play, uh, players, the Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on, and other countries that don't have these huge players, that don't have these huge data silos, um, need to find a solution for this, how they can share the data, how they can still, if it's necessary, preserve uh, privacy, preserve the ex or control the access and incentivize this. And there have to be technical solutions. This is very important, like blockchain distributed ledger solutions. Um, but we also need to think of the governance behind that and the incentive structures behind that. Um, so how do we bring the companies to share uh, this information? So this is something we have seen in a, in a research project that, that was funded by the German state uh, with companies like Bosch. So for Germany, we have all these old uh, companies, these engineering companies, uh, the car companies. They build very good products, but the data it is challenging. So they are producing data, but they cannot control all the data here. And they have like small silos, and it would be so great to combine all these silos and then uh, into a huge pool and then run uh, the training al algorithms with all of this. And we have seen that this is such a huge problem to combine all of this. It's not so much a problem about like interfaces, technical, um, but it's also about the incentivization about the control of the data, what do they get back. And I guess this would also be something for international cooperation, for international science cooperation or international um, cooperation uh, when it comes between companies. So I think this is a huge research topic and yeah, things like uh, blockchain distributed ledgers can, can play a role, but I think this is not the, the, the end here. We need to do much more research in this, in this direction. Thank you. Um, Constantine, I thought yeah, you wanted I, to add something. Yeah, yeah. I actually want to like rewind a little bit to the, to the like question, which was like, so what sort of industries are like, uh, are impacted by AI the most uh, in like our opinion. So as, as for me, I have again, this like fine example. So this uh, like delivery logistics and stuff like this. So just think about it. On the one hand, we have this like, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon automated warehouses, which are full of, you know, like robots, which are, you know, like sorting parcels 24-7. Uh, so, and it kind of makes us think so that sooner or later, uh, every, you know, like, that all pick up and deliver a thing will be handled by some sort of AI agent, right? So we're, we're looking at it. But on the other hand, so in case for you guys who are living in the big cities like Moscow, what we're like witnessing on the street, we have uh, like, uh, if you go outside, you see that like nowadays the streets are food with the uh, humans that are carrying food for other humans. So I mean like basically if, uh, if I'm kind of sitting in my home and I'm kind of lazy enough to go to like some fast food restaurant, I can, you know, like order the food and it's not the robot. I mean, like, so from like technological perspective, I should be, you know, like kind of positive and say, well, that's the job for the robot. It perfectly suits it. And we have all the, like the full stack of technology and the robot actually can do this. But why uh, the, you know, like the low paid human actually brings me this food. So, I mean, like all these uh, examples there, like AI in medicine, AI in delivery, they are all kind of, you know, like, in my point of view, like controversial because that's, that's what we're seeing. So on the one hand, we have this, a uh, huge development in AI, like uh, in medicine systems, which are based on some you know, like AI methods and technologies. On the other hand, uh, Ali mentioned that you won't trust any like medicine system, uh, medical system, which uh, cannot explain you why it actually comes with this. You know, like uh, I mean, like the answer to your question. So that's funny thing to think about like which industry you, you think will be impacted the most because even you know like the most well suited industries uh, we are witnessing that I mean like AI is not like actually like taking invading them so we still have like a we're, we're still at the beginning here Aaron. 
um, well, the, the first insights or first takeaways of uh, the potential impact that we'll hopefully, in an optimistic uh, sense, uh, see in the next uh, couple of decades. So my last question um, is also maybe a little bit critical, but you know, from challenges, you can learn a lot, right? Um, so what challenges um, should we consider when we implement AI technologies? And this one I would like to shine the spotlight on, uh, Constantine, uh, to kind of, as you're coming from more of a technical perspective and uh, work a lot with robots, et cetera, um, what are some of the challenges or risks that you see from a technical perspective um, in implementing various AI technologies? Yeah, yeah. as for technical risks, they're, yeah, they're evidently we, we're witnessing them. Uh, the thing is that we're quite comfortable as the researchers in the lab environment, right? So we're cool, we have this, you know, like large amounts of, you know, like curated data and we're able to rerun experiments in case they fail and like stuff like this. But the problem, and we can even achieve, you know, like really high accuracy rates, like 99%, like which is like really cool. But at the same, uh, I mean, like at the same time, uh, when you move out of the lab, right? So I mean, like if you're like in real life, uh, these uh, high like accuracy rates are not enough uh, because you're obviously like uh, say like driverless cars. You do not want a driverless cars which has you know like a uh, uh, accuracy of like 99 percent of uh, in 99 percent of of 100, it actually you know like detects pedestrian ride. It just won't, you know, like satisfy you as, as a human. So for the lab environment, it's kind of okay. Uh, even like 99.9% .9 is not enough for, you know, like for out of the lab environment. And actually this issue, in my opinion, as far as I know, uh, I'm like, it cannot be solved uh, by, you know, like uh, by the guys like me. I mean, like uh, there there's surely always be this technological gap. So we won't achieve, you know, like 100%, at least for some very, uh, you know, like uh, complicated tasks. So we can solve some tasks with 100% accuracy, uh, but some tasks which are like really relevant and really impact our like everyday lives, uh, we just cannot come up with technical solutions which are like 100% accurate. And uh, this this is really, you know, like kind of technical problem, but we do not have like a technical solution to, to solve it. So that's a kind of, you know, like dog chasing its tail. And yeah, that's <laughs> this thing. Thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to maybe um, expand on any particular challenges that you see um, in regards to like the huge amount of data that's uh, being produced to train these algorithms and what it implies for innovation and the relationships between big platform companies and startups? Well, I guess most of that has, so no, it has been mentioned. addressed already before, I guess. Um, when it comes to the relationship between startups and, and, uh, and big companies, again, there's the problem. We have the big companies that have all the data. We have a small company that has maybe a cool new approach, a cool new algorithm, but it doesn't have the data. So um, does this lead to the, to the point that we see maybe already in the, in the Silicon Valley, that we have a, a small sta startup that is pretty cool, they have a cool idea. It starts to grow and the big companies just um, it cannot survive alone, it gets grabbed by the big company because uh, they are just uh, uh, too big. And um, this is still mostly, I think, the case because of just the capital. But um, when it comes to training of algorithm, again, this is also very important. So I don't know, maybe we need some kind of regulations for that or we need these kind of data markets, we need to balance this. I need to, know, uh, to find new approaches here to, to, to approach this, yes. Uh, Maxime, would you maybe want to add uh, something on the technical risks or potential challenges of AI and its implementation? I'd like to comment on that from a little bit different perspective. So artificial intelligence is not only about machine learning, which is based on the data. I understand it why actually machine learning based on data is uh, quite interesting and quite innovative, but we see that computation has become very efficient and uh, there are real breakthroughs in terms of applications, etc. But really, 
the artificial intelligence, this is about the expert systems and many other technologies which are not so dependent on the data. The practice shows that really it would be good to pay attention to that and to rethink it all, the development of the artificial intelligence, because the data, as was said, are dependent on the people, are dependent on the society we live in. If we compare the data obtained from the Asian nations on some ethical questions, and the data which we obtain from some European nations on the same ethical questions, they would be dramatically different, strikingly different. And a lot of ethical and practical uh, questions may arise due to those uh, systems. But uh, now, when many database technologies actually are, have the linear development, we have a question whether we have to focus on the old systems, on the new systems. Probably this is where we can expect the breakthrough. Uh, for instance, speech technologies. We work a lot with uh, Mr. Ashmanov's group. Igor and Stanislav Ashmanov's, uh, they're working on uh, dialogue systems and machine learning. It reaches a certain plateau. If we speak about machine learning alone, it cannot go further. It is devoid of any emotions. No understanding, no comprehension is there. And I talked to them a lot, and so they came up with a hybrid s system. So this is an expert system plus machine learning. And probably this may give birth to totally different technologies. Thank you very much. So that concludes my four main topics of uh, how it will affect a society, which we've come to the conclusion that it will have a, a pretty big impact. Um, however, we, we don't have to fear of the Terminator happening anytime soon, um, that it will probably affect uh, many prominent industries, uh, and that there is indeed a lot of potential, but with that potential, there's challenges. So um, now I'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, if there's any questions uh, for our panel, um, please, behind here. Um, we met this morning at the Higher School of Economics. <laughs> Uh, Yuri Packham of High School of Economics. Noch eine Frage an Michael Kubach. So imagine a dystopian scenario when uh, the sensitive data or maybe uh, complex artificial, artificial intelligent algorithms fall prey of a rock's tide. Uh, what, what can we do? And what a scientific community we can do about it? So, sorry, the, can the, the data can, can what? If, if the data, if the, the huge amount of sensitive data uh, falls in the hands of a rock tide. Of a, a root state of a... Ro rock tide. Uh, uh, terrorist nation, terrorist nation. Okay, uh, thank, yeah, thanks. kind of. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe a sensitive algorithm that would allow profiling and things like that. Uh, how can we counter that threat? And how... As a scientific community, uh, we can count a lot. Yeah, I guess uh, when this happens and we don't have a preparation, then it's uh, already too late, I guess. So I think this is something that we have to think of now. Yes, absolutely, because then, uh, then, that, then it will be too late. So we have to find like cybersecurity counter strategies to counter this, and we have to think about uh, our strategies. What do we store where? Like we cannot put maybe everything into the cloud, so uh, maybe we can all only uh, put parts of it into the cloud. We have to know how we design our algorithms so that they can, that this data cannot be extracted through the input. And uh, I think this is this is just a point. I mean, this is like how we uh, should we prepare for the uh, the Terminator coming? So should we pre prepare for this? Um, um, yeah, super AI that might might come there. This is the next step. So, um, yeah, I mean, if it has already happened, well, uh, parts of it ha probably have happened. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a it's a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> I guess this uh, this reiterates the importance uh, that 
we need to think also from a, a government level that you need to invest your time on looking into these technologies that are quickly being developed by these industries and also in research and how this is also important on a diplomatic and ethical level. Yes, it's certainly not just a technical question here, but also a political question and that uh, question of, of maybe methods, counter methods that go beyond AI so or be, be beyond computer technology, but traditional maybe security uh, measures. First, we discussed, we said um, that uh, artificial intelligence as a topic is very interesting for Germany, which already has uh, an AI high-tech strategy, and it is very relevant for Russia as well. Russia is developing such a strategy too. My question goes to all the panelists. How do you see the potential of cooperation between Russia and Germany in the area of artificial intelligence? Let me start, probably. We did a lot of research when we were developing this strategy. I had my personal input into the artificial intelligence strategy, me and my colleagues, and we analyzed the number and quality of uh, international relations. Russia is, uh, the Russian scientists are cooperating with more than 60 countries on that issue. And the Russian Germany cluster of cooperation is very strong. Really, Germany is among top three countries. I would not rank them as number one, number two, or number three, but this is among top three countries. We have very strong cooperation on the development of the artificial intelligence. This is not only about the artificial intelligence, but also some assistant or auxiliary systems. This is about high efficient uh, uh, computation and uh, big data analysis, sensors, IoT. So there is a big potential of our cooperation, so because we have uh, lots of cultural contacts lots of uh, interdisciplinary groups it should be noted that if we analyze the statistics in terms of the mega grants uh, extended to uh, fellows to the scientists we have a lot of uh, german scientists working for our projects and certainly it serves as an impetus uh, for the development of the russian german relations i do think that we have a huge potential there and we have to take advantage of that why? Because the world is changing, and uh, we see different policies pursued by different nations in the world. We have to understand uh, what uh, role is played by Russia. We already said that the United States and uh, China uh, actually uh, say, let's give it a try, and then we'll regulate that. Uh, Europe. On the contrary, try to regulate everything and then would try it. So it was an approximation, certainly, but to put that in the simple terms, if we look at the EU documents on the artificial intelligence which were recently adopted, they take a very conservative approach to those technologies. Russia has a more pragmatic approach. Within our strategy, which we proposed for the government, we tried to approach differently different aspects of the artificial intelligence. For instance, uh, cybersecurity, what may pose a threat to human health and life, we have to be more conservative. In the areas which are aimed at new technologies, so you have just to give all the freedom to that. Why? Uh, the cooperation between Russia and Germany has to bear in mind those questions. We are living in the world which uh, has several approaches to the artificial intelligence, and moreover, and this is a very flexible s system. These uh, approaches are changing. This is what we have to bear in mind. Thank you. Let me get back to the question of cooperation. My answer would be obvious, so I'm sitting here in front of you, so and uh, I'm not bored at all. I know how to entertain myself, and there are many open-ended questions, and so we have to cooperate. 
Oh, do you think that uh, there is a huge potential here in Russia? Proceeding from my personal experience, uh, in Russia you always work with people who you know, who you trust. And in order to know a person, you have to see him. That's why I would like to ask everyone present, I know that my colleagues are doing that already. So once you start playing at certain level, just like in football, you know the players from other teams. So please publish your, uh, make your publications in English, read the very best uh, journals, because actually uh, what you write would depend on what you read. You cannot read everything. So I am uh, fond of reading, but you cannot read everything. Probably this is not honest, this is not fair, and probably uh, there are some uh, extremely important things written in Russian only, but uh, it is not possible to read everything in Russian. But once you know the person who wrote something, or at least you know that um, certain r and Institute may have uh, certain research and you trust it, or if you trust certain community, then certainly you would begin to find out what uh, they write or what they investigate. My experience is that you would read only the works of those who you know personally. And I'm speaking not only in my personal capacity, but I talked to my colleagues and I also asked to, uh, there are many strong young ladies and guys uh, from among the fellows, from among the scientists living in Russia. I do not uh, advertise in migrating to Germany. And uh, actually the background, so the education, the system of education actually is very strong. And uh, you know that I got my uh, primary and secondary education here in Russia, and I know that language barrier is uh, a stumbling block, but probably AI may be helpful. There are Google Translate and other machine translations, but if you don't hit the ball, you will never score a goal. So just send your articles, and uh, believe me, I got more rejections than any of you. You just have to make up with that. Just give it a try. Send your articles to the journals. Just suddenly you would be disappointed then. You would think that um, the supervisors are right. You correct something and you will be published. And back to the Chinese. They are good not only in terms of science, and it's not about some genius ideas, not only about that. So they are good in execution. So execution matters. So if you showcase something, I don't mean just engineering, I mean just academic science. Just if you have some successful case, just speak a lot about that. Uh, people in the West can know about that too. Thank you very much to our panelists and to the organizers. Um, I think this concludes our panels. So I'm looking forward to the reception. Oh, maybe one more. <laughs> the last and uh, the most brief uh, question answer, actually. We are looking forward to the reception. I will be brief. Chinko from the Ministry of Education Science. That was a very interesting discussion about uh, the transfer of knowledge, uh, transfer of uh, technologies. Our natural intelligence has a huge potential, and uh, uh, actually, we are limited. That's uh, we are not limited yet, and that's why we are training the artificial intelligence. Do you think that um, uh, eventually the artificial intelligence may have an impact on our natural intelligence? That it would be training us. It would have an impact of on our consciousness. For instance, there is such a notion as uh, creativity psychology. What would be primary for artists and what would be secondary for the artists? Some people believe that uh, an analog fine art uh, actually has no sense. Probably can uh, artificial intelligence contribute to that? Let me just tell you that I noted and that it was said that uh, there are different notions of what an artificial intelligence is. The artificial intelligence we were speaking about, as Maxim said, this is more about uh, deep learning, machine learning, statistical methods. And when you ask me about terminators, etc., etc., I believe in some positive things, but always there are people who are smarter than you. 
and would have other motivations. I think that uh, this is a heavy eye. This is uh, something different. This is what we as people can do, a combination of different data sources as human beings. This is what we can process ourselves in real time, visual data, audio data, speech data. When we reach this level, when we have a combination of uh, these things and technologies, I think, I think that uh, the combinations and integrations of different components are extremely interesting and important for AI and uh, natural sciences. I don't know whether I address your question, but uh, hopefully the reception. All of us will be there, so we are more than welcome to uh, answer any further questions at the reception. Now on to Okay, okay. let's thank our panelists. Oh, I would like to thank Rachel for excellent moderation. I do think that you have lots of questions, so we all have lots of questions, and uh, I do think that we communicate very well at the reception. Now we'd like to give an opportunity we spoke about startups and new technologies. We wanted to give an opportunity to ladies, to scientists, not ladies, but to scientists to present their startups. Svetlana Yefimova, she will do that via Skype. She is on her way somewhere, but she agreed to present that uh, via Skype. Svetlana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you well. Svetlana, I have introduced you already. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you the solution about the future of the artificial intelligence. And if we have simultaneous translation, I can speak slower. Yes, there is one. Okay, excellent. A few words about Oz Forensics, which I'm privileged to present. We we are digitalizing any documents, photos, etc. And so we try to counter digital swindling. These cases are real life, and I have a permission to speak about those documents. So this is a kind of document which we would receive from our clients. So it means that we get proof of identity and proof of legal address. It may be an ID. It may be a scan of the document or the utility bill, which really proves that, for instance, Mr. Anders resides uh, in that address. Our solution is used by banking sector, by insurance sector. So how it acts, so we recognize the documents are uh, trying to detect any forging or faking. We uh, check whether the documents are original. We compare the face of a person against the person on the ID. We check whether this is a live person or this is just a video uh, on a mobile phone or any other device. And we do the check of the database. Neural networks are very helpful. This is how we may quickly uh, study the document. And uh, this is how we may check whether this is an original or probably it's an original, but no longer valid. For instance, the date has expired. And suddenly we compare certain milestones. And we may say that, for instance, this person wants to get an access to uh, other person's account uh, because one person is 10, the other one is not 10. So this is a different person. The same checks 
the technology is not the technology this technology is widely used by some payment systems by utility companies insurance companies are quite helpful one of our clients using that technology managed to increase uh, the maximum amount he lends to his clients because now he is more confident about uh, the clients thank you so much Svetlana thank you so much for a very interesting presentation we have one more startup another successful enterprise called Semantic Hub Vitaly Nidelsky, founder and Semantic Hub uh, first president thank you so much as far as we have run out of time I will be very brief so may I have a clicker okay this is my presentation we just got acquainted with the organizers of that event uh, during my trip I um, set up two associations a couple of years ago one is of the international our internet and the other one is about the robotics and we had a very interesting chip uh, within the framework of industry 4.0 robotics artificial intelligence industry 4.0 I think that these things are on the rise and we see more and more companies working in that area in particular the same time three and a half years ago I found people developers uh, who were developing semantic technologies actually these are uh, this is a kind of software which um, recognizes the text and understands what it is about you may use that in order to read scientific articles and make technological focus where you may look for terrorists um, surfing internet and we decided to make a company which we called semantic hub and first year we just did some training uh, doing projects for Gazprom from the Ministry of Education and Science and for others some pharmaceutical company for healthcare so we saw that one of projects uh, cannot uh, create uh, enough value this is just like with artificial intelligence once you don't have a versatile artificial intelligence uh, where even you cannot address different problems using uh, same methods of the artificial intelligence I would say uh, the narrower the segment is the bigger expertise you have and the narrower the methods of the artificial intelligence uh, you use are actually the better results you would obtain we decided to focus on the farm industry pharmaceuticals because uh, they have lots of money R&D in big pharma this is the biggest R&D uh, in the world and they're spending twice as much on marketing we did several projects or several products we are reading uh, social media uh, patients portals when people ask a questions uh, ask questions to the doctor share their symptoms uh, share their comments and uh, proceeding from millions of posts which we have read we can build the so-called patients landscape turned out that big pharma is very much interested in that and the way of the patient where the patients landscape this is something you have prepared for the market once uh, actually companies are bringing new drugs new medications to that market what people are writing on the internet being aggregated it becomes a reality of the world equal to the clinical tests or something which you obtain from some medical instrumentation devices why because people are writing very accurately and honestly because they want to obtain certain assistance and result and they write in every detail because actually they look for the second opinion they consult doctors and any opinion they would like to check and actually uh, there's even such a notion as dr. Google and uh, we even found such an out that once you got first uh, opinion from 
Dr. Google, then the second opinion should be provided by Yahoo Doctor. But still, this is about big data. And they are real because they are true and because they're big. So the technological experience helps us to translate the human language of how patients describe their symptoms into the medical language. You may use dozen methods in order to say that uh, uh, you have uh, pain in your belly. Actually, whatever you write, we would understand what it is about and uh, we would uh, put that in medical terms. Second conclusion which we made is that our tool is more useful in case of some uh, difficult diseases or orphan diseases. Orphan diseases are quite interesting, so I'm just uh, changing the slides. There are some words uh, which probably reflect uh, what I'm speaking about, but uh, certainly I'm not following the slides. This is how I will get back to the orphan diseases. So this is just how the software marks the text. Uh, these are different substances which are derived from the text. Let's speak about the orphan diseases. Whether you know or not, there are more than 7,000 orphan diseases, different genetic mutations. All in all, if you sum them up, if you sum up those people, there will be quite few people per 1,000. Mm, say one person uh, out of 10,000 people, but all in all, this would be 350 million people living on the earth with orphan diseases. And uh, uh, the death rate in early age actually explained by that. And um, actually, the average search rate is eight years. This is a big problem for the pharmaceutical companies which have developed a drug but cannot find a patient. Most of the patients are somewhere, somewhere there, looking for their diagnosis. When we aggregate all the medical data, all the descriptions uh, provided by the patients, we train the software to use symptoms in order to make a diagnosis. So make a kind of a patient's profile. Just like, for instance, the doctor, when talking to the patient, would have some uh, alarm signs when he sees some strange combinations of uh, factors. He may suspect that uh, uh, the person has contracted some orphan disease and uh, send him to some genetics uh, checkup. This is what our system does. It uh, identifies people with uh, unconfirmed diagnostics, diagnosis and uh, somehow would mark, mark them with red. In that case, uh, such a patient would be sent to an appropriate doctor and so the doctor would send him to the genetics uh, checkup. So if the diagnosis is confirmed, he would be listed among those uh, who are entitled to free medication. Orphan drugs are usually very costly, uh, half million dollars or less, but anyway, it would be the government which pays for that in all the countries. We, our platform is multilingual. We are working with Russian, English, German and Chinese. We can uh, take contracts, for instance, when a global company is marketing its medication in several countries, we can make um, patients' landscape for those countries to understand the companies which what uh, the path of such a patient to that country would be. I will miss that slide because I've told you about the orphan diseases already. We are working with most of the international companies which are present in Russia, and we managed to identify very interesting things. So once you've completed your first contract, uh, actually, this is what takes a lot of time to do the due diligence uh, to become an international supplier, following international rules. But once you have completed your first contract and got the first reference, 
immediately we would get five more contracts from the same company. So because you have confirmed, you have a proof that this model works. Second step, you would be brought to the headquarters so that you could work for different markets as well. So we have the following phase. We are setting up our offices in Switzerland and uh, China in order to be closer to the client. My team is uh, 20 people strong, very experienced people who are working for major companies who are real experts, but at the same time, my core team is diluted with the young computer programmers or linguists. We are training them for this very specific way. Summing it up, I may say that <coughs> certainly the artificial intelligence per se, this is a tool, and it works better when it is assisted by experts. So uh, the artificial intelligence will never substitute or replace an expert. But working together with a man, it's just like a knife may um, somehow help us to excavate some traditional things, uh, actually 3% in the world, out of all the orphan disease patients um, uh, are administered the appropriate drugs. So the artificial intelligence helps us to identify those patients, and then they follow the regular route. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you so much for your introduction. Thank you for your ideas, dear colleagues. A couple of words to wrap it up. May I have a minute of your time? I said in the very beginning that uh, we surprise. So all the time we were speaking about how a man looks at the artificial intelligence. And now at the reception you'll have an opportunity to look at how the artificial intelligence looks at a man. We have certain technology which is ready to show emotions of a man and how to turn those emotions into the art. I invite Ulyana Andrei Vradi, who will tell us about that technology very briefly, and then we go up to, to the reception. Thank you so much for your invitation. We are artists, painters who are working with the new technologies, and today we'll show to you our new interactive project called Transparent Waves. It is de devoted to a dialogue between a man and uh, the artificial intelligence. As Michael has noted, uh, it is dedicated to how the artificial intelligence sees us. It can see us only by means of sensors. That's why we are using the so-called uh, mimics and emotions articulation recognition system. Then it all is being encoded, and we generate the emotions of every person. We are all unique, and that's why our emotions are unique. That's why never you will uh, come up with the same picture. So if you want to give it a try to that technology, so you are most welcome. <laughs> 